This is QTV News. I am Maria Masani and thanks for joining us. Now the main local, international and sports news headlines. After some of the most dramatic days seen at the National Assembly, members voted by a narrow margin to reject a draft bill seeking to give the Gambe a new constitution. African descendants residing in the country have called on the Gambian President and the Ministry of Justice to grant them citizenship. The National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institutes, TVET, on Tuesday held a press briefing to highlight the plight and lack of support to TVET. A community-based organization in the Upper River region is training young people in the region on agricultural activities to achieve food self-sufficiency. In international news, today is the 60th independence of Mali after gaining independence from France in 1960. And in sports, World Football Governing Body FIFA reveals that all the 54 member countries in Africa have applied for the COVID-19 relief fund. Top two Ugandan athletes are leading their national team to the World Athletics Half Marathon Championships in Poland next month. Now the local news in detail. Stay tuned. After some of the most dramatic days seen at the National Assembly, members voted by a narrow margin to reject the draft bill seeking to give the Gambia a new constitution. More in this report. After the draft, the consultations, anticipation and debate and three attempts to tally the votes, it all ended like this after 4 p.m. on Tuesday, 22nd September. These are the results. The eyes, 31. The nose, 23. Members had voted to reject a new constitution by the narrowest of margins. For the bill to have survived through to a further reading, it needed 42 members to vote in its favor, but it never came close to achieving that. On the announcement of the results, there were more dramatic scenes as those on the winning side briefly left the chamber to celebrate their victory. Over the course of the day and a half of debates streamed live to audiences around the world, members had risen to say their peace for and against the draft constitution. Now, you want the legislature to determine who should be in the executive and should also have a hand who should be in the judiciary. Is that democracy? I urge my colleagues to do what is right by passing this bill. Like I said, I have the masses to have a say or have a chance in a referendum. The discrimination aspect of the new draft we have seen a lot of discriminatory clauses in it. We need to cherish this constitution and make sure so that it is passed as a nation. After the sometimes rowdy statements, interjections and interventions, it was finally turn of the Justice Minister and Attorney General to respond to concerns. When he rose to speak, he spent less time on his feet than most members. His was not an attempt to influence one side or the other. Simply, he set out the pros and cons of accepting and rejecting. And no answer at this stage kills the bill right here. After all the talk of a new Gambia and of a draft constitution which for once had truly saw the views of its citizens, the country is left with the constitution it had at the start of the whole process. Over the next few days, we will speak to those on both sides of the slim divide and will bring you a special report on what this all means for the Gambia. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sise. African descendants residing in the country on Tuesday called on the Gambian president and the Ministry of Justice to grant them citizenship. The move came after what they said is the Constitutional Review Commission's failure to include a section in draft constitution relating to an exception clause for African descendants. Babakarsi has the rest of that story. They called the Gambia home and argued that their great-grandparents were captured and taken to the West as slaves. They are back home to where they call their ancestral land and want to be allowed to settle as full citizens. Some of them say they have invested heavily in the socio-economic development of the country, but the law as it stands requires them to be resident in the country for 15 years before they can apply for citizenship. This, among other things, is behind the formation of the Council of African Decidents with the objective of getting recognized with 8,315 signing a petition in support of automatic citizenship. Juliet Ryan is the co-founder of Blackseed YouTube channel. She told journalists that they are part of us, meaning Gambians, and that they have worked so hard to find their roots, which happen to be Gambia, 
Thus, they should be allowed to settle without having to stay for 15 years before applying for citizenship. 15 years. We have to wait 15 long years through the process of naturalization to get citizenship here. Although other international rules and laws indicate five years is sufficient in other places. But in Gambia, it's 15 long years. I was invited to Ghana. So I did have a choice as to where I went. But my heart is in Gambia. And I think that's really crucial that, you know, we're, we're here because our heart is here. And because my grandma told me that, you know, a long time ago that we came from a place called Cambia. But I didn't find Cambia on any map. It was only after my second visit here that someone explained to me that Gambia used to be called Cambia. So therefore, I was able to trace my ancestral roots. Luke McKenzie is the chairperson of the African Dissidents Residence in the Gambia. According to him, their dreams are not yet fulfilled. We, when we bring our money, all our money stays here. We don't take our money anywhere else. We have nowhere to take our money. Okay, we come to settle, we come to stay. But the situation is, is that we don't feel safe having no citizenship. We don't feel safe that we're going to invest our money and something could happen and our investments go to waste. Matthew Hypolite is a member of the Council of African Dissidents. He used the opportunity to stress that they have been through a lot in Europe and the Americas. Thus, they don't expect to come back to their grandparents' land and be called foreigners. We are you and you are us. You know, We weren't asked to be taken away from Africa. We were taken away from Africa. So our foreparents were maybe your aunties or your uncles or maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents. They knew my great-grandparents and you know, we were taken from here. So to, be, to come back here after all the struggles of slavery and all the other things that we've been through, to come back here and then be called aliens and have to jump through hoops in the same way as we have been doing in Europe or in America or in any of these places, it's a little bit disheartening. According to the members of the council, their ancestors were not subjected to any citizenship laws or immigration laws when they were unlawfully kidnapped and taken as slaves. Therefore, they are calling on the government of the Gambia to come to their rescue, saying they don't mind going through a two-year process to satisfy government requirements to be given citizenship, like Ghana and other African countries have done to African dissidents. Babu Karsi, QTV News. The National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute on Tuesday held a press briefing to highlight the plight and lack of support to the technical and vocational education and training TVET centers. Since their closure of all schools by the government, Lolly M. Kamara reports. National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute is representing all TVET institutes across the country. The aim of TVAD is to contribute to promoting self-employment, promoting employability, enhancing socio-economic development, and supporting lifelong learning. The chairman of the National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute, Ablaisal, said, TVAD centers across the country were ordered to close for business to minimize the spread of the coronavirus disease since its outbreak in March. Six months on, Saul said restrictions were eased in other sectors, but nothing has been said about the TVET centers. The chairman is calling on the government to allow TVET to open for business because, according to him, skilled centers usually work with matured, educated, and responsible people who would respect COVID-19 preventive guidelines. The only sector that is affected is uh, basically the, uh, the training institutions. And we feel that it is not fair and it's not even good for the government themselves because we are doing, um, we are doing something that the government was supposed to do. It's the responsibility of the government to train its youths. So we are taking that chunk from them. So the least we expected is support because in other countries, TVET centers are sub subvented by government so that they will be able to help uh, train the youths. The Secretary General of the National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute, Mohamed Fofana, outlined that their objectives as an institution has been threatened by the pandemic. They are contributing 60% to the human resource development of this country. 
and if we allow them to die down like this one, it means we are killing education sectors in education itself in, in, in the country. And so we are asking the government, not forcing them, but to see how best they were able to bail out, just like they bailed out most of their subvention institutions with GTI, MDI, to also help us so that we will not die and then allow us to have a befitting barrier, which we are not even praying for. The PRO of the National Association of Vocational and Skills Training, Demba Sala, also states that a large part of the youths are sitting at home doing nothing. Sala added that several consultations have been made with government and the Ministry of Higher Education, but no progress was made. These are our youth folks, our young brothers and sisters sitting at home idling, doing nothing, when they could have been gainfully employed by finishing their training. Now, we thought we should invite you people also, the media people, so that you can also share our stories and people at least somewhere could listen and then come up with definitive decisions. Responding to issues raised by the National Vocational Training Institute, the permanent secretary at the Higher Education Ministry, said schools across the country remain closed, stressing that if only other institutions are operating and they left behind would have raised an alarm. But that does not happen. Permanent secretaries also revealed that the University of the Gambia are planning to start an online classes in coming weeks and institutions might follow. The National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute was established in 2001 to serve as an umbrella organization of TVATs in the Gambia. For QTV News, Loli M. Kamara. Tumana Agency for Development, a community-based organization in the Upper River region, trains young people in the region on agricultural activities to achieve food self-sufficiency. More in this report. Agriculture is one of the most important sectors in the Gambian economy. According to Gaipa, the Gambia has 558,000 hectares of good quality arable land, of which only 200,000 hectares are currently on a rain-fed agricultural production. Many young people who constitute 60% of the Gambian population do not see agriculture as a lucrative sector. Tumana Agency for Development is working on changing the narrative by giving young people in the Upper River region an opportunity to gain theoretical and practical knowledge on horticulture, beekeeping, packaging, amongst others, to help improve agriculture in the region and provide income generation. The purpose of this farm, one, is to enhance food security and nutrition through building the capacity of farmers, especially young people. Young people. So the farm was officially established in 2016, uh, funded by uh, West African Food Security Program through United States Peace Corps. Mohamed Drame added that the agency is conducting trainings on value addition and packaging because too much is lost post harvest in the region. We have conducted a series of training for young people. Uh, just last year, we secure a funding from United Nations Development Program uh, Global Environment Facility Small Grant to train 30 young people on best agricultural practices, uh, value addition for horticulture products and also entrepreneurship. Why do we conceive this training? Uh, in this region, post harvest loss is very huge. Uh, by April, March, if you come here, you, will, uh, you can even, people will donate you freely all these horticulture products. But at this time, you find it very difficult to get it, even if you have money. Mark Anisila is a beneficiary and spoke of the difference between what she was taught about agriculture in school and what she has learned from the Tumana Agency and called on young people to venture into agriculture. <laughs> I benefited a lot from this because the way we are taught about farming in school and the way it is done here is quite different. Therefore, that alone is a great achievement for us because we learned a lot. I cannot walk on this farm without farming tools. If we can have all the tools we need, that will help us. Farming is very important. If you are chosen for this work, make best use of it because the knowledge we gain from it will take us a long way. 
According to Gaiba, Gambia has great potential for irrigated agriculture with fresh water from the river Gambia, rainwater if harvested and fossil water that can be drilled. It also has a weather pattern that is suitable for almost all production. This sector is mostly ignored by young people due to lack of access to finance, markets and more. Time will tell whether Tumana Agency has been able to effect a positive change among young people. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jenna Mosonko. We will go for a short commercial break and when we come back, the news continues with some more local, international and sports news. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. Surveillance Equipment Award $400,000 is Tuesday presented to the Gambia Red Cross Society and the National Youth Council by the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the United Nations Population Fund. Marie Louise Ensani has more. The community-based surveillance equipments presented were mobile phones, signal registers, visibility jackets and bicycles. The equipment will be used by the two institutions to work with young people in various communities to sensitize them on precautionary measures in the fight against COVID-19. Receiving the equipment, the Secretary General of the Gambia Red Cross Society, Al Hassan Senghor, tells us the Red Cross role in surveillance. It's an auxiliary to the government, meaning it uh, complements what government does. Therefore, the Red Cross role is basically anchored around the needs of the people and the priorities in supporting those institutions that work towards addressing the needs of those individuals. Mr. Senghor added that the Red Cross are frontliners and not only in the fight against COVID-19. Frontliners here not only in terms of COVID but in terms of humanitarian needs or humanitarian assistance. When a disaster strikes, the people who are part of those communities are the Red Cross volunteers. They feel it, they know it, they get the information, and this is how it goes from those communities up to where the information is supposed to reach. Kule Adeni, the UNFPA country representative, says the project will be a great support to the national surveillance system and the country at large support to the national surveillance system as we go forward. What is this project? The simple idea is to work with young people in the community who for now are yearning to be involved in the response. Like Alaji said, we've seen many groups yearning, trying to do something or the other. But the idea is that the young people receive training, are appreciated, are supported to support their communities, their people, their mothers, their fathers. Mr. Adeni added that the ministry has always found ways to facilitate this partnership and outline what they intend to achieve in this program. Increase quality uh, disease surveillance and contract tracing in our communities, not only uh, a lot, not, not only in the greater Banjul area or West Coast 1 or 2, but you know, the other regions of the Gambia, who for many reasons, which is not particular to anybody, might always seem to be left behind in in development process and projects in the country. Um, we do intend and we understand that this project will bring increased case detection, you know, monitoring and tracking. Mustafa Abite, the Director of Health, says the surveillance project is an important one and one they are taking seriously. It's a very serious project. It is a matter of life and death, and it is. Because the data you give, the information you give, the people you contact, you know, like Mr. Kunle said, and many people will say, directs the response. Gives us information as to what we do next. And so we have to take it very seriously. I'm not expecting that, but it will be very good that the data we get should be accurate and timely. The surveillance project will help bring accurate information and will help to monitor and evaluate emerging patterns and trends to assist with disease prevention and related matters. 
Mary Louise and Sanyang for QTV News. Members of the newly formed Fournier Bintang Karanai Farmers Association on Sunday conducted a long tour of six out of the 120 farms they cultivated this year. Our report, reporter Lamin Dabo was with them to assess the progress of their crops. Supported by Fournier Dindim Federation, the 120 farms are located in different communities within the Fournier Bintang Karanai district. The crops produced are groundnut, rice, maize, beans, melon, and findi. The aim is to promote food self-sufficiency and to reduce the economic impact of COVID-19 and look to a post-COVID future. During the tour, the association's president, Alaji Ibrahim Abiyai, expresses delight for the hard work, dedication and commitment of his members, adding that they are expecting a bumper harvest at the end of the farming season. Yusuf Joe Gomez, the program coordinator of Fony Dindim Federation says the Federation's doors are open to all the farmers in their intervention areas in Fony. Advice to the other four districts because we operate in five main districts, in five districts of Fony. And right now we have this association within Fony, Bindankaranai only as at now. So I would also advise the remaining four districts to form this kind of association so that together we will work together and uh, make sure that we cover the entire family that we support within these five districts. The Agri Extension Supervisor Bala Musa Koli commends members of the Farmers Association for their efforts, saying it will lead them to a successful harvest season. Any farmer, if you want to be successful in your crop production, early clearing, early planting, good seed, so, during the first rains, these are some of the messages that we give to farmers. And I advise everyone who is a farmer to please take the advice of extension workers. If you see government forcing them in your district, they are there to help us to work hand in glove. So thank you very much, and we are very much happy for that. The collaboration between the extension workers and then the farmers in Fony Bintang and the whole entire Fony. It's excellent. Alhaji Modulamin Jobate, the chief of Fony Bintang Karanai, who initiated the formation of the association, congratulated all the members for their outstanding collaboration and called for more support to enable them to meet their objectives. I'm appealing to government to create marketing for these groundnuts. How these farmers are going to market these groundnuts is very important. Mobilizing them advising them, telling them, coming out, until they realize their produce, finally, there is no market. There is no encouragement to farmers for that. I know government is there. They have their plants. It's already there on food. But we have to remind, to add something to them, farmers have to be very, 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 very uh, catered for. Following the coronavirus pandemic, many communities have been affected causing many to look for additional sources of income to mitigate the impact. For these farms, the future looks promising. For QTV News, Lamin Alai Fandindabo. We will take another short commercial break and we continue with international and sports news when we return. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, this is QTV News. In international news, today is the 60th independence anniversary of Mali gaining independence from France in 1960. Mudulamin Choi and Maria Mafal take a look at the country whose military last month outstead its president in a coup d'etat. President day Mali was once part of three West African empires that controlled trans-Saharan trade. They are Ghana, Mali, from which the present day country is named, and the Songhai Empire. During the empire's golden age, there was a flourishing mathematics, astronomy, literature and arts covering an area 
twice the size of modern-day France and stretched to the west coast of Africa in 1300. Rock paintings and carvings indicate that northern Mali has been inhabited since prehistoric times when the Sahara was fertile grassland. The country fell under the control of France during the late 19th century, during the so-called scramble for Africa. By 1905, most of the area was under farm French control as a part of French Sudan. In early 1959, French Sudan, which changed its name to the Sudanese Republic, and Senegal united to become the Mali Federation. Mali achieved independence in 1960 as the Mali Federation, following Senegal's withdrawal from the Federation. The Sudanese Republic declared itself the Independent Republic of Mali. Moudiba Keda was elected the first president. Keda quickly established a one-party state, adopted an independent African and socialist orientation, and extensive nationalization of economic resources. On 19 November 1968, following progressive economic decline, the Keta regime was overthrown in a broadless military coup led by Musa Traore, a day that is now commemorated as Liberation Day. The subsequent military-led regime, with Traore as president, attempted to reform the economy. His efforts were frustrated by political turmoil and a devastating drought between 1968 and 1974, in which famine killed thousands of people. The Traore regime faced unrest beginning in the late 1970s and three coup attempts. However, after a long period of one-party rule, a coup in 1991 led to the writing of a new constitution and the establishment of Mali as a democratic, multi-party state. Football is the most popular sport in Mali, and the country hosted the 2002 African Cup of Nations. The national team made fell at the semi-final stage and then lost the third fourth-place playoff to Nigeria. The team finished fourth in the next edition of the tournament, and their best finishes having third-place finishes in 2012 and 2013. Mali is currently facing many huge challenges and pressure from the international community. Last month, the nation's president and prime minister were arrested by the military following a mutiny arising from protests over continuing economic wars and a worsening national security situation. The soldiers detained several government officials, including the president, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, who resigned and dissolved the government. Representatives of several countries condemned the coup, as did representatives of the African Union, European Union and the United Nations. The president of France, a country which has been involved in fighting an Islamist insurgency in its former colonies since 2013, called for power to be returned to civilians and for arrested leaders to be freed. The United States has also cut off military aid to Mali. Former Malian Defense Minister and retired Colonel Bandao was named interim president on Monday. If all goes according to the military leadership's plans, he will oversee an 18-month transition period for new elections to return Mali to civilian rule. The leader of the junta, Asimi Goita, was named vice president. In spite of recent troubles, we wish the people of Mali a happy Independence Day. Mahmoud Lamin Choi, QTV News. And in sports, World Football Governing Body FIFA reveals that all the 54 member countries in Africa have applied for the COVID-19 relief fund. More in this report. Every FIFA member association can apply for a grant of up to 1.5 million US dollars, with a twelfth to be spent on women's football, a key element of the COVID-19 relief fund. Oli Rain, the current governor of the Bank of Finland and chairman of FIFA Fund Steering Committee, said, essentially, this is not about distributing money but achieving the right social and economic impact to support club football, players, staff, youth academies and member associations through these troubled times. Ren also told reporters that the COVID relief fund is for associations which request and require full compliance with the best auditing standards because there is no place for corruption in football. There will be two audits carried out on all funds devoted to countries one by the Federation, different countries, and the other by a FIFA-approved auditor. Thailand are using the funds to resume its national league, including COVID-19 tests and starting the use of VAR, video assistant referee. Mexico is using FIFA fund of 1.5 million US dollars for its women's league, while Brazil is using the funding to support purchase COVID-19 tests for their women's league. In the Gambia, the Gambia Football Federation have started distributing the funds to the clubs and member associations and are working towards the resumption of the league on the 1st of December 2020. And teams are advised to start pre-season training around mid-October 2020. 
Confederations can also apply for up to 2 million US dollars in funding, and four of FIFA's six confederations have done so. It is understood that CAF, the Confederation of African Football, is not among those who have applied, despite postponing a handful of income-generating tournaments and facing legal battles that could amount to tens of millions of dollars after abruptly cancelling a billion-dollar broadcast deal last year. Babu Karsi, QTV News. 5,000-meter world record holder and 10,000-meter champion Joshua Cheptegei and Jacob Kiplimo, world cross-country silver medalist in 2019, are leading the Ugandan team to the World Athletics Half Marathon Championship in Poland next month. Here is the report. Jose Cheptegei, the world cross-country champion and 5,000-meter world record holder, with a time of 12 minutes, 35 seconds, 36 Cheptegei in 2017, won a silver medal in the 10,000 meters event at the World Championship in London and 2018. Chapter Guy set a world record for the 15-kilometer road race and became the cross-country world champion in 2019. 20-year-old Jacob Kiplimo, the winner of the 5,000 meter at the World Athletics Continental Tour meeting in Ostrava with a personal best of 12 minutes, 48 seconds, 63 also represented Uganda at the 2016 Olympics in Rio, Brazil, making him the youngest Ugandan Olympian at the age of 15. Kiplimo has the world leading time in 3,000 meter, which he ran during the Rome Diamond League this year and is the fastest teenager at the 3,000 meter in Uganda and the holder of the, his country's record at the distance. The team includes the 2009 under-20 world cross-country bronze medalist Moses Kibet. Juliet Chekwell, the 10,000-meter half-marathon and Ugandan record holder for women, leads the women's team. With their recent performances on the track, Cheptegei and Kiplimo are among the favorites to win medals in Poland, even though this will be their debut at the half-marathon distance. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jenna Bosongo. Before we end this bulletin, let's have a quick reminder of our main stories. After some of the most dramatic days seen at the National Assembly, members voted by a narrow margin to reject the draft bill seeking to give the Gambia a new constitution. African descents residing in the country have called on the Gambian president and the Minister of Justice to grant them citizenship. The National Association of Vocational and Skills Training Institute, TVET, on Tuesday held a press briefing to highlight the plight and lack of support to TVET. A community-based organization in the Upper River region is training young people in the region on agricultural activities to achieve food self-sufficiency. In international news, today is the 60th anniversary of Mali gaining independence from France in 1960. And in sports, world football governing body FIFA reveals that all the 54 member countries in Africa have applied for the COVID-19 relief fund. Two top Ugandan athletes are leading the Ugandan team to the World Athletics Half Marathon Championships in Poland next month. That's all we have for you in this edition of the QTV News. Do join us at 10 p.m. for another edition. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.